Hello chess fans and welcome back. It's been quite a while since the last time I have done a video. Uh, I was recording videos primarily when uh, all the chess clubs uh, started meeting virtually online so that way I had a way to continue coaching my kids and, and get them content. Uh, and then once we started meeting back in person, I just didn't really have the opportunity or the need to put out as much content, but I've missed doing it. And so uh, recently, I got to be the tournament director for a tournament with some kids playing in it, uh, some local kids. Uh, it was a really good tournament. It was really fun. I've missed directing tournaments, so it was a, it was a good time. I uh, had some of my own kids play in it, uh, but uh, one of the games just had a spectacular finish uh, between two kids that have really worked hard, and I've, I've seen them ever since they started playing. Uh, so it was really neat. I wanted to take the opportunity to kind of go over their game. Now realize that this is not top level play and I'm not a top level commentator. So this is chess for the rest of us. It is not GM level analysis. It's not GM level play. I want you to, to point out the two kids playing in this game. One before the tournament was rated 732 and the other was rated 847. Both of them did very well. Both of them had a good rating boost uh, by the end of the tournament. Uh, this is one that I even considered if... Uh, <laughs> I, I think this would be a really good one for guess the ELO for uh, uh, Levy Rosman's uh, Gotham Chess Channel where he tries to guess the ELO based on their performance because in this game, I don't think you'd be able to guess the ELO. Both players played very, very well. Uh, I feel they played above their rating. Um, this was, in fact, the last game of the last round of the tournament in the top section. These kids were playing for first place. The winner won all four games and was uh, had a clear first place finish. Um, but I wanted to go over this one because it had such a spectacular finish. Uh, and it starts with uh, with jail with the white pieces playing c4 playing uh, my favorite opening the English and so that was that's always fun to see when when somebody picks up an opening like this uh, mainly because at this level they there's not a whole lot of knowledge and so as long as you've got some general ideas you can you, you can generally play it pretty well you still have to be able to play chess you, if you start hanging pieces it doesn't matter how good your opening is uh, so she plays with c4, and uh, Archie plays with e5. Uh, whenever I play with the English, uh, e5 is always the move I really don't want to see, but it's the one I typically do see. Uh, it's followed by knight c3, and then knight f6. So a lot of competition already going on for the d5 square. Um, now, interestingly, white follows up with e4. This, to me, is a little premature. I don't like playing e4 this soon, although I find that I'll, I almost invariably end up playing it anyways. But what I've noticed in my games when I'm playing the English, when I've got c4 and e4 on the board, I've just given up way too much control of the d4 square, and a knight typically gets anchored in there, or some one of black's pieces gets anchored in there, and it just causes me problems, um, especially if I can't find a way to drive it off. A lot of times, I'll end up bringing my uh, knight from g1 over to e2 to deal with that, hoping to induce a trade. Um, and then end up fianchettoing my bishop uh, on the uh, g2 square. Uh, we'll see how white decides to play with this. Uh, so black continues with knight to c6, um, which uh, again, that's really common to see after the e4 move that because uh, the d4 square now is already a target for that knight. Uh, then we have knight f3. Uh, it's not where I would typically play the knight, uh, but it works just as well. Um, and then black plays bishop c5. Now there's an interesting uh, there there's an interesting opportunity here. You may notice that that eval bar uh, just went up a little bit for white. It's it's settling back down. It's not it's not a big thing, but it's always fun to play because it 
it, especially at this level, there's an opportunity here to take this pawn. It looks like it would be protected by the knight, right? But if you take it and black captures back, then you can play d4 and fork the knight and bishop. Obviously, they can go ahead and win that pawn back by taking with the bishop, but then you see the queen comes in uh, and there's just better development for white. The knights are going to get kicked around. So, generally, uh, that bishop c5 move, you got to be careful with that because when that, the that's a little tactic that white can play to get some extra development uh, and some initiative. Uh, instead, uh, white plays bishop e2 and just continues developing. Black plays d6 uh, and then we have castle. All these moves are really standard. Notice we don't really see any, any blundering or anything going on yet. Uh, black comes back with knight d4, putting and, and there it is. We said that was coming. The knight was going to come to the d4 square. It finally did. Uh, now uh, it's threatening to remove the light squared bishop if uh, white doesn't do something about it right away. Uh, so white does, white goes ahead and captures the knight, but now we've got this uh, bishop anchored and this is, uh, I like to call this the strong bishop. Black's uh, dark squared bishop is the strong bishop because it's the same color square as white's king. So white is always going to have to deal with the fact that the black bishop now is on this long diagonal with a pin on the f pawn pointed at the king okay so after we get the bishop there white plays d3 trying to make some space for her own bishop we have some development from black bishop e6 and then bishop e3 now the right move here for black um is, uh, well, black black plays back. Black tries to save the bishop. That's probably not the best thing to do. Um, capturing, capturing the bishop, uh, however, also results in a recapture with the f pawn, and then you've got the, the rook on the open file. But white would have the doubled pawns to deal with. Instead, black play, plays back back, <laughs> that's hard to say, black plays back to b6, and, and here's an opportunity for white to get rid of black's strong bishop. White could go ahead and capture immediately, and after the recapture, then play f4, and play for a break, and that would get rid of the e-pawn, or potentially, if played again, trap in that white bishop and create some space for the queen and the rook to maneuver towards the side where it looks like black is going to castle. So it seems like the best move here for white would be to go ahead and capture that bishop on b6. Uh, instead, uh, white plays b3. Um, this does, you know, connect the pawns. Uh, not real sure that it's particularly useful. Um, it removes the diagonal for the queen. Um, and this pawn really wasn't weak yet uh, on the c4 square. Uh, but so it just, it still creates some extra strength on c4. Uh, but it does continue to allow black some dark squared control. So after b3, we have c6, um, which looks like is trying to prepare for the move d5. So white preempts that and plays d4. All right, so what does black do here? Um, if you leave it alone, then after the trade on e5 if white decides to initiate it uh, then everything should look pretty even so for example if black ignores it black could go ahead and castle and then if white exchange is all the rooks and queens are connected on both sides you've got the open d file uh, 
black has the chance to capture the bishop, which would re re result in triple pawns. Really, this is this might be a line to look at. Okay, so black cat. Let's say black castles. White captures. Um, black could capture right away, uh, which is probably best. But then black is also still threatening to capture on e3 and create isolated double pawns which would be a good thing for black so in this position really the best thing to do is to ignore d5 um, the other option that white would have would be to go ahead and push um, but because black had the move c6 already present there could be some trades here um, and it all depends on the order. There's so many different ways the captures could go, um, and black could just scoot back. And now the, the C file is the file that's open instead of the D file. So there's a lot of ways this could go, but black decided to go ahead and capture. Um, e takes D4. So now we get uh, the bishop, we get a big exchange, the bishop's exchange come off the board, but notice this is better for white. Not only did, did black lose that dark squared bishop, but after the exchange, white has better development. The queen, the knight, and the bishop are out. Uh, the king is already castled, the rooks are connected. So black really gave up some initiative in this, in this move order by not castling, but instead capturing. Okay, so, here, black does ca go ahead and castle, um, and then we have the move uh, e5. Okay, e5, you, you may have seen the eval bar just kind of drop again and say, oh, we're back to even. Uh, yes, the computer thinks this is completely even. The advantage was lost. Instead, what should have happened before trying to do any r breaks is go ahead and start centralizing your rooks. Bring your rooks over, um, particularly getting this rook over on d1 would be particularly uh, advantageous. Either rook to d1 would be good. That way, after, the, after you play e5, once the recapture occurs, when, when the queen recaptures, there'll be a rook staring at the black queen. So it would have been really important to put a rook on d1 first. Instead, we have e5 and then the natural recaptures. And so again, this is, in this situation, the, I think the computer was given like three or four moves, all with just uh, goose eggs all over for the evaluation. Just anything looks like a draw. Okay, so black again, uh, it kind of makes the same mistake white made. What black really needed to do is go ahead and scoot this rook over and start threatening some revealed attacks on the queen. Instead, played bishop to g4 immediately, um, and we just get this exchange of bishops, um, and the queen comes over to g3, and the knight plays back. So notice, we've gone through several moves and the eval bar still says just 0.0. .0. Uh, this is looking like it's very even, very symmetrical uh, in terms of pawns. Um, and it, it, the computer's just expecting a, a liquidation of all the pieces and just go to a draw. So. Let's see how it goes then. So we have, next move was rook A to D1. Uh, natural to uh, go ahead and centralize a rook and threaten a queen. The queen plays to A5, and then the other rook centralizes. Again, still all zeros. Um, the expectation is black will centralize rooks, rooks will come off the board, eventually luft will be made, and uh, everything will just go away. Uh, black plays rook a to d8. Um, notice you saw, I don't know if you if your resolution is good enough, but there's a real slight 
increase. It's now 0 0.07. That's not really anything. Uh, I think the computer liked uh, rook to e8 better, rook f to e8. Uh, but still, this is virtually nothing. Um, but I think what black was thinking here, based on the way black continued to play, was try to find some way to exploit a pin on this knight. You know, if white would go ahead and trade, then this knight here on c3 can't move because black would be threatening to take the rook on e1 with checkmate. So that's, that's what I think black was doing based on some of the way the, the play continued, looking to hopefully find some sort of tactic for a quick back rank mate. Uh, instead, white makes her first uh, mistake in the game. Uh, I think white also was thinking about this, uh, this pin, um, wanted to get the knight more involved, but what that does is that actually gives up the a2 pawn. And interestingly, black makes a mistake by not taking it. <laughs> Instead, doesn't realize right off the bat the opportunity that has shown up on the board and instead plays uh, rook over. And this is why I think black was really, really thinking about the, uh, the idea of capturing on e1. He's, it looks like just trying to pile up as much pressure on e1 as possible. And so in doing so, completely missed the pawn hanging on a2. Uh, th that really may be the only mistake black makes this game. Yes, there's some times where it doesn't quite take advantage of some of the opportunities, like with the uh, pawn exchange uh, on d4 earlier, where uh, it should have castled instead. Um, just missing a2 is really the only uh, I don't know if it's called a blunder yet, because it's not, you'll see the, the eval bar really didn't even give it that much, not even a full pawn's worth. So after the rook plays to e8, um, then you have king f1. Again, there's, both players are just so focused on this e1 square. Uh, this time, black does not... Uh, miss capturing on a2. <laughs> now you notice black does capture and the eval bar pops back up for white. Uh, computer thinks that trading on d1 before capturing would have been a little bit better. Uh, the reason for that would be uh, it would leave two pieces pointed at that knight with only the king defending. Uh, if the trade had happened first. So if you need to see that, if you can't imagine the whole thing, that would play out rook captures d1, rook captures d1, queen captures a2, and now we've got some extra threats on that knight. Okay, uh, so instead black captures a2 immediately. Um, white is looking to relieve some of the pressure plays rook captures d8, rook captures d8. Uh, and then we have knight to c3. Um, this is the second major blunder. Not only does knight to c3 not produce a legitimate threat on the queen, but it blocked white's queen's protection of the b3 pawn. Now, while this is a mistake, I think white was looking for ways to trap black. White was looking for something to trick black into playing a move that would give white checkmate. While it looks like black has all the threats for the back rank mate, white is not given up yet. I can guarantee you uh, she's not the sort of player that would give up. She's always looking for ways to turn things around. 
So the black does not miss taking the pawn this time, and white plays queen c7. Not only did she abandon the b3 pawn, but it looks like she's abandoning the knight as well. But that's the trap. If black plays, captures, whoa, what just happened to the eval bar? There's a mate in two on the board, All right? You might wanna pause your video and make sure you can see where this mate in two is. It should be pretty obvious. All right, did you find it? It is pretty clear. It's queen captures d8, knight blocks, and then either queen or rook can capture with the win. However, that is not the way the game went. Instead of capturing the knight, black captured the pawn with check. Okay, that was the correct move. The knight plays over to e2. Uh, black now has to realize uh, black is missing both, uh, it has got both a rook and a pawn that are loose uh, and plays queen d5. Obviously the rook is the more important piece here. The black, um, I think a little bit stronger would have been to come to d3 that would have protected the rook and maintained the pin on the knight. Uh, still, this is completely fine. White has just given away let's see, all three queenside pawns that were there. All three queenside pawns that used to be there are now gone. White really needs to do something about the fact that black still has all of his queenside pawns and maybe start taking some. Uh, instead, what you have is the move knight to c3. Uh, not really sure what's happening here um, because black is able to just now play to that d3 square and the knight goes back. This is the move. This is pretty much exactly what uh, black should have done the last time, except for now, not only is black in the right position, but it's also black's turn. So white basically baited black into getting to the correct position and giving black the turn. Now, uh, the best thing for black to do in this position is, well, there's really two options trade down and then use the queen side majority to just start marching everything and get the queen back or just skip that all together and just start marching especially the b pawn because notice the b pawn will promote on the b1 square which is protected by the black queen uh, so Marching the b-pawn or trading down would probably be in black's best interest here. Um, black instead mobilizes the knight, knight g4. That seems a little risky. Um, taking one of the protectors from the king away. Um, white probably should have played h3 in this position and maintain pressure on the rook and these pawns, but instead, oh, did not play that move. <laughs> played queen to f4. Okay. This uh, forces the knight to return, but now the queen's out of place. The queen was... I mean, white's position wasn't great at this point, but the queen was doing a lot better at c7 than over at f4. What white is really wanting to do is get the knight in the game. And that might be why the queen was brought back, was thinking about uh, finding ways to get the queen in the game. But instead, to get the knight in the game, 
plays king g1. And uh, I don't know if you can see the e val bar. It doesn't look like it moves that much, but this goes from a minus four to a minus nine. It says this is the equivalent of giving away a rook. Now at this point, uh, uh, jail with the white pieces uh, had started to run low on time, was probably under a minute at this point. Archie still had a few minutes left. Uh, when this move was played, uh, Archie clearly recognized that there was an opportunity and spent, I don't recall exactly how much time. It was not very long, probably about uh, maybe a little bit less than a minute. Uh, I think he recognized immediately the opportunity that was there and wanted to make sure that it was a real opportunity and it was not uh, that there was no counterplay or something he was missing but then finally made the move you might want to pause your video and see if you can find this move this again does not look like a move an 847 would play it just doesn't uh, and this next move is the last move of the game when this was brought out uh, JL uh, looked at the board, recognized um, that there was really no coming back at this point. She looked for a while for an option, and while she was looking, her time ran out because she knew there was no good way around it. The move that Archie played was Queen takes the knight on e2. Okay, why this looks like a, uh, aren't you just giving up your knight for a queen? Uh, but if the rook captures the queen, then black's rook comes down to d1 with check. And when the white rook blocks, the black rook would take and it would be checkmate. So the knight is lost. Three pawns are lost. White has run out of options here. Uh, the game does not have to be over at this point. White has two moves that can um, potentially save the rook, but would still leave white down a knight and three pawns. The only moves that work are queen to c1, putting another a piece on the back row to defend the king or queen to e3 so that the queen trade is essentially forced and once the queen's trade on e3 you would obviously want to recapture with the f pawn otherwise you get into the exact same situation before where if you capture with the rook then black's rook is going to come down to d1 and mate you so that was the end of a very well fought game. Even those instances where White dropped the pawns, she thought she had something. And uh, you could see um, that uh, her opponent was still kind of processing everything and saw the dangers and was very much aware that one wrong move would turn this game around very quickly. He stayed composed, did not take the bait, instead just played smart chess, and then when he finally had the opportunity to play an amazing tactic, he throws out, queen takes the knight on e2, and it was a spectacular way to end a hard-fought game, uh, a spectacular way to end the tournaments, uh, it was very exciting, and so Archie finished in clear first place, picked up over 150 rating points, broke 1,000. Um, and so amazing tournament for Archie. want to congratulate him. It was just uh, exciting to get back to over-the-board chess. I'm looking forward to more, more tournaments uh, and, and seeing some cool games and, uh, in the future from these kids. So... That's it for me. Hopefully I'll have a cause to make some more content, more videos soon. I'm sorry that I've been away so long, uh, but 
I guarantee you I've still been playing chess, still been coaching, still been learning, and hopefully you have been too. So I will see you next time.